Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. We are having a few technical challenges this morning with audio so please be patient uh, we were we are going to push through and uh, to the end I think things will catch up and improve as we go uh, this webinar is being recorded so you will receive a link to the recording as it will be uploaded to the Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel shortly after broadcast thank you thanks Laurie well, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, Crop Talk for September 25th. Uh, and uh, again, as we get through harvest here, uh, there's uh, issues that are always seeming to be uh, popping up and uh, we'll be discussing quite a few of those today as we go through. Uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about today was uh, the soybean cyst nematode. Uh, David Kaminsky, our field crop pathologist, has been doing some work in the province here, uh, searching them out to see what kind of extent they are uh, happening in, in Manitoba here. And I thought it'd be a good idea today to get them to uh, come on and talk to us a bit about, uh, I guess, what they are, uh, what, where to look for them, um, basically just their whole life cycle and uh, what kind of damage can be done with them. So uh, I guess with that, Laurie, we'll turn it over to Dave and uh, hopefully the audio works for us good and we'll, uh, have a good show here today. So take it away, Dave. Thank you, Lionel. Good morning, everybody. I uh, would like to correct one thing Lionel said, and that's uh, that I'm the one who's been out looking for this particular pest, the soybean cyst nematode. Um, finer minds than mine are on the, the hunt for it. And uh, I've only recently got back with Manitoba Agriculture as the field crops pathologist, I did coordinate the general survey of soybeans for diseases, um, but this is not a pest that we routinely look for or expect to find in that survey process. These recent finds that you may have heard about um, are the work of Mario Tenuta and his team from the University of Manitoba. Of course, uh, they're funded and supported by us and by the Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers. So I called my uh, presentation this morning, how will Manitoba's soybean producers respond to new findings? And uh, I always begin with a question. Here's another one. What's the latest on soybean cyst nematode in Manitoba? We use that abbreviation SCN um, just for brevity. So what is the recent findings? Uh, Mario and his team have actually seen some insisted female nematodes infesting soybean plants in commercial fields. That's new this year and uh, that came to light in August. Um, we put our press release out in September because this is not a panic situation we've known it was uh, coming for some time. Mario and his team have been surveying in Manitoba since 2012. The first finds of any cysts in fields was in 2017. Uh, those were found by molecular means or sieving soil, uh, but they were never associated with soybean roots, living plants. So, um, We've known that it, it's been here for some time. Uh, we have documented it. Um, we want you to know about it, but it's not uh, at the point where we're really raising major alarm bells. The pests arrival, we knew about. Um, the things that have led to it are an increasing dependence on soybean. It's grown to be the third major annual field crop in Manitoba after canola and wheat. So its frequency and rotation um, is one of the things that, that leads to the buildup of a pest like this when it uh, first appears. It can be here for many years without causing above ground symptoms 
and uh, we'll see that as we work our way through the presentation. It has not yet been detected through uh, seeing visual symptoms above ground. So where has this pest, soybean cyst nematode, been found? Here's the most recent map that uh, our GIS people have put together to help show the 18 municipalities that have been surveyed and the four in which we have confirmed that the nematode is present either through molecular means or by finding cysts. And why is it that it's so hard for us to find them if we're just pulling or digging plants? Well, here's a picture of some soybean roots and this is uh, from the finding this year where cysts were on roots. Can you make out some cysts on those roots? They're about the same size as the water droplets on this person's thumbnail but that's one of them right there and there are probably three or four along the length of that side branch root. So they're very tiny. Those are the engorged females full of eggs um, you'd only see those if you dug the plants carefully, probably uh, soaked the roots for a little while, washed them carefully, and then uh, looked at them. You might see them with the unaided eye. You probably need a hand lens or some kind of magnification to see them. What are nematodes? Nematodes as a class of, uh, or grouping of plant pathogens they are microscopic worms. They're kind of unlike any other things that we know of that cause plant disease. Here's an example of the life cycle of the soybean cyst nematode. And there's a caution at the bottom that all the life stages here are not shown at the same magnification. So let's start with the soybean plant in the middle. And you can see uh, nodules on the roots. Can you see my pointer on your screen? I hope so. Those are nodules on the roots. Uh, the yellow are little um, immature cysts. The brown ones are mature cysts, which are full of eggs. And then you move to this, which is a, a great magnification of what it, a mature encysted female full of eggs looks like. She's essentially dead but she's full of living eggs. And over time, um, in the right conditions, those egg sacs break open and are released into the soil. They have an immature worm within them. That immature worm breaks out of its egg sac and moves in the soil. Um, they don't have much uh, as far as uh, skeleton, so they really move by flagellating or wagging themselves around and they move through water films. Somehow they find soybean roots and they push their way in. Um, the tiny little black thing that you see at the one end is a stylet, which they use to puncture plant tissues and then they can suck juices back in. Um, so the way the females work is they actually embed themselves in some of the uh, water and nutrient conducting vessels within the core of the root. So they're getting their nutrition from the plant. And after they've been fertilized by the males, uh, the females begin to swell up and fill with eggs. Some of these eggs are internal, some are outside, um, but later within the same season, they will become dry and crusty and they actually protect some eggs within their bodies. That's probably way too much technical detail, but uh, here's looking at a root microscopically and we see one full cyst here, one that's probably broken open, that's part of a vestige, but this is one of those very fine side roots of the soybean plant.
The recent uh, news that's been out there, you might have heard this on the radio or in print, um, it's based on a news release that we collaborated on with Dr. Tenuta and his team from the University of Manitoba. Manitoba Agriculture sort of plays quarterback on this uh, issue, but we work very closely with the commodity organization who are housed just across the back lane from us. Uh, we put out simultaneous releases. They're not exactly the same because we focus on some uh, different issues. We want to keep ours as basic as possible. Manitoba Pulse growers want to get into some of the management aspects already. These are both live links, which when you get the presentation later on, you can follow to the actual news releases. I won't do that but I'll take you to Manitoba Agriculture's release, which came out on September the 16th. And I'm not gonna read it to you, but you could if uh, you're looking at that part of the screen. Um, the picture on the right is a soybean root and some cysts on the fine feeder roots of the plant. To show you the size difference between those cysts and the normal um, what do we call these things? Uh, nitrogen producing uh, nodules, pardon me, on the plant, which are from inoculating the plant. Uh, there's quite a size difference between those. These images come from a gentleman at the University of Wisconsin, and they're found on another link, uh, the Crop Protection Network. I'll talk about later on, or you see it down at the bottom here. If the nematodes built to a level where they were very plentiful in the soil and a susceptible crop was planted, what might we see as symptoms on the above ground parts of plants? Well, the first thing is some form of yellowing, also known as chlorosis, on the leaves in mid-season, well before you should see that kind of thing. Plants will be stunted, often in patches. And of course, those symptoms could point to a handful of other pathogenic diseases and some nutrient deficiency symptoms, even some uh, soil conditions like iron-induced chlorosis that uh, look very similar. Thankfully, we haven't seen uh, or been drawn to finding the nematode by these symptoms. So we feel that in general, it's out there at a very low level, but it is out there. So what can soybean producers do? Well, you can investigate in your own fields. If you see patches like that, stunting and yellowing, uh, get out and do some digging, pull some plants, uh, put them in a jar of water and uh, soak away the soil and have a look. See if you could distinguish them yourself. It's not outside uh, the realm of possibility that you could do that. I think all of us should consider rotation with non-host crops for a two to three year period. What are those non-host crops? Well, the only host crops besides soybean are other edible beans and uh, field peas. Even some other legume crops are not known hosts. There are a few weed hosts, of course, but uh, we're considering crops, which we'd be planting a lot of. Let's get away from uh, soybeans every two years or even every third year. Uh, a four-year four, four rotation could be ideal in managing this. As with, uh, well, we've been talking about club root in canola and one of the chief means of preventing its movement to new areas or building within areas where it's established is the prevention of the movement of soil between fields. And there's lots of ways this can be done. Cleaning equipment, uh, cleaning tires of vehicles that move from areas of 
known or suspected infestation to what might be clean fields. I think we're at the point where we could already consider soybean cyst nematode resistant varieties in those RMs that have positive cases. And for that, you could turn to a resource yield Manitoba, pardon me, seed Manitoba, in which they have tables that show um, which of the soybean cultivars out there are already known to be resistant to this pest or tolerant of it. So that's very short, quick and dirty on soybean cyst nematode, what we know about it today in Manitoba. I haven't gone further afield. Uh, maybe I will just pop up a distribution map um, that shows the intensity of soybean production in Manitoba right now. And uh, Lionel asked me before we started if any surveying has been done in Manitoba. I'm not aware of any. Our general survey we can find to Manitoba and we determine the intensity of that survey based on uh, the intensity of soybean production in various RMs. So I think I'll leave it at that and turn it over for questions, if you have any. And that's the way okay, to Dave, contact um, me if you want to get a hold of me afterwards. Okay, Dave, uh, can I just get you to put that map back up again, the last one? Lionel or Lori, are you going to come back on? Yeah, uh, Dave, can you hear me? Hello, Dave. Dave, are you there? I am here, Lionel. Did you lose me? Okay. Uh, there is some questions. Uh, sorry about that. We had a a delay right at the end of your presentation where we couldn't hear each other there. But uh, okay. uh, one question uh, is, uh, are lentils affected by the soybean cyst nematode? Um, they're not a, a good host for this pest. Um, to my knowledge, we produce less than 5,000 acres of lentils in Manitoba this year. Is a question coming from Saskatchewan? Um, I would have to double check. Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, crop insurance told us that um, near the end of their reporting, we only had 1,500 and some acres of lentils in Manitoba. So we have sort of given over production of that crop to Saskatchewan and other places. Being that it's uh, similar to peas and its growth habit, would you think there might be some uh, some issues there with it? On field peas? Well, yeah, like basically, you know, crops that um, nodulate and, uh, you know, uh, I'm just wondering if there would be some uh, similarities between those type of crops. Mm -hmm. And you said edible beans. So. Yeah, I I can't rule it out at this point. It's just not listed among the known hosts of this pest. And perhaps it's that um, soybean production and lentil production have not overlapped to that extent because lentils are really ad adapted to a drier situation. Um, one other question is, um, so um, how fast can it actually build up in the soil? Like, will a rotation of three years be enough for it to go down in the soil or eliminate it from the soil, or is it always going to be present at a certain level? It's going to knock it back significantly. If uh, a non-host crop is grown the next year, 
those um, eggs will hatch and those juvenile nematodes that come out will starve to death because they don't have anything to feed on. And that kind of knocks back the population significantly. They're pretty dependent on a living host. The insisted female can live apart from the host through the winter, but uh, after that, um, most of them uh, break open, release their eggs, and the eggs hatch when it's wet next season. Um, but simply a two-year break is not uh, ideal because uh, again, you've got potential weed hosts that might keep a a larger population um, thriving in a field in between soybean crops. But uh, the source that I'm turning to right now is um, a book on soybean pests put out by that crop protection network that I talked about. Uh, Carl Bradley from, oh, I forget exactly where he's from, is one of the authors and it's very thorough on soybeans and all of the pests that uh, that crop has. And um, we don't need to look very far to areas where the incidence of the pest has grown or the severity of the pest has grown to a point where it's causing problems. In Southern Ontario, they have soils where they have a thousand times the number of uh, nematodes that we have detected in soil samples here in Manitoba. And there, of course, they're seeing symptoms, patches in field, yield losses, that sort of thing. Another question that just came in that's actually kind of related to that is uh, wondering what, what the severity of it is uh, to the south of us. So I guess in like North Dakota and those areas where uh, they've possibly been growing soybeans for a longer period of time. Yeah, I think that in North Dakota, the area that's um, close to us, um, they're not yet at the point like Southern Ontario, some Southern Ontario fields uh, where they have that intensity. But we've watched it creeping northward and the first finds the ones that go back to 2017 were in those three RMs that are clustered down along the U.S. border um, and on either side of the Red River. So we imagine that uh, some of the first introductions might have been through floodwaters. Okay, well, uh, I think that's uh, all the questions I got uh, right now, David. So uh, thanks for uh, for coming on today and giving us an update on the soybean cyst nematode. Um, I think uh, it'll be something that uh, people will be watching anyways here. So I think uh, we'll be updating if things uh, things change or or get worse. So uh, sounds like uh, something that almost needs to be watched, like uh, like the club root issue that we're dealing with in canola. Yep, there are some parallels, although we're at an earlier stage in its history in Manitoba. Thanks, Lionel. Hey, David. Okay, so uh, what we'll do now is we'll continue on with the uh, crop update. And uh, again, we had uh, uh, a week of uh, weather that uh, got farmers out of the field and uh, I guess watching the rain come down, something we hadn't seen all year and then seems to uh, want to continue following following right now and uh, um, surprisingly enough uh, producers did get back in the field here in the last couple of days uh, things dried down uh, uh, enough where uh, you know uh, aeration and dryer dryers were able to be used to uh, to get some of the moisture down and I think uh, producers are out there trying to take off as much as they can before uh, any of the next uh, rainfall events uh, come through. So just with the uh, part of the normal update, um, um, just want to go through the uh, 
uh, past seven days and our seasonal summary of some of the things that have happened over over the past week. And uh, as we can see, uh, rainfall events were fairly common throughout the majority of the region. And because of that, it's uh, brought our yearly rainfall levels up to 100% plus in a lot of areas. Uh, oddly enough, there's still some areas that uh, are on the low end and still haven't uh, haven't reached their 100%, but they, they must be just missing some of those rains or some of the larger rainfall events. Uh, we did uh, hear reports of uh, some uh, some rain in some areas getting to excess. Uh, um, just a, f a few off the top of my head. I know the, uh, in some of the south of Brandon areas, reports of anywhere from five to seven inches in some places. Uh, uh, a lot of places reporting in uh, two to three inches. Uh, so uh, it's uh, something that uh, definitely made the fields wet and made for uh, for travel a lot more difficult uh, and kind of just threw another uh, another hazard into the uh, 2019 harvest. When you look at uh, our harvest progress, uh, you know, on a weekly basis, we uh, we update this and when you compare it to our three year average, uh, we have uh, uh, gotten closer in, in some areas, and I, I think the majority of the uh, uh, percentages or what helps increase the percentages is the eastern side of the province did get a little bit of a jump start on, on harvest, and because of that, they were uh, farther ahead before these rainfall events happened. So that's why some of these percentages are, are fairly high. Uh, when you look at spring wheat at 86%, uh, and our three-year average around 94%. Uh, I would say that in the uh, in the southwest and northwest regions here, that uh, our spring wheat uh, harvest is probably more in that 60 to 65% complete. Uh, some areas might be a little bit higher into that 70% range, but I think we're uh, about 15% uh, below the, uh, the the provincial average right now. Um, Barley and oats is pretty much, and field peas are pretty much, uh, I would say, very close to those percentages. Canola, uh, again, we would be dragging a little bit behind there. I think uh, one of the things that happened over the past uh, uh, week was a lot of producers left cereal crops because they were fairly wet and, uh, and went to some of the canola, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. <clears throat> Flax. Uh, uh, again, I haven't heard of too many people harvesting flax or soybeans, uh, so those percentages are probably fairly accurate. So, for for the southwest and the, and the northwest region here, when you uh, look at a percent of normal precipitation, and then you uh, compare this map, and I didn't do it, but we should have uh, had the map for uh, about uh, you know three weeks ago. Uh, we definitely wouldn't be seeing all these dark blue areas, and you can see where our levels, uh, pretty much through all of the southwest here, have gone to be anywhere from uh, 110 to 130 percent of normal. So it's amazing what uh, a couple of big storm events can do. And then you see there's another pocket in the southeastern part of the province, and that's where some of those storms that have been coming up from the states have been just been clipping the side of the side of the province here. When you look at what they're forecasting for the next three to four days, uh, it doesn't uh, bode well for a lot of harvest being done. Uh, I think uh, a lot of producers uh, realized that uh, yesterday and we're starting back out on the fields again after being uh, rained out a couple of days ago and uh, so guys, we're going again. Uh, again, I think uh, the biggest issue there is uh, trying to find the driest field uh, to go on. Not that any of the any of the grain is dry. It's just uh, try to find either a field you can travel on as well as a field that you can actually do something with the grain, whether it being uh, aerating it down or 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 grain drying. I think uh, those are a couple of uh, things that have definitely kind of come to the forefront in the last uh, week to 10 days where uh, I should say even longer than last, you know, couple of weeks where producers are definitely looking at uh, different ways of, uh, of drying grain down. And we've been getting quite a few questions regarding uh, grain drying and, and artificial drying of grain. 
put this up because a lot of the forecast uh, in the last uh, uh, three to four days has been talking a bit about uh, frost and the potential frost for this coming weekend. And uh, it, uh, it doesn't look good when you look at the forecast as to whether we might be getting it or not. But I thought that uh, this would give us what we normally would see on an, on an average uh, uh, days our first fall frost and this map is like 50, 50, the rating at 50% uh, so in other words uh, you know out of one out of every two years we would normally uh, get the, a frost during these dates and when you look at pretty much all the western side of the province we're anywhere from the 18th to the 21st uh, is the yellow part so definitely in that range for this weekend through here and the 15th through the 18th and the 9th through the 12th through the Northwest and the kind of the Verdon Brandon area. So we're in a situation where one out of two years we would have had a fall frost in these areas uh, by now. And uh, and when you add in, you know, this coming weekend where they we're getting some reports or some calls for some cooler weather, uh, you know, basically we're on our, one or 50% average or one out of every two years that this normally would happen to happen for us. And, you know, you can move even eastern, east across the province and you look in the brown area here at September 21st to the 24th. So again, they're in, uh, in their situation too, where, you know, basically the whole province is right now in a situation where we would normally have a frost one out of every two years. What has uh, been uh, a pleasant surprise, I guess, is that uh, striped can canola has been, been the best for drying down uh, after the last couple of rain events. Uh, there's been a lot of producers that have left cereals and uh, are commenting that uh, canola standing is uh, is been the driest uh, that they've been able to find. Uh, a lot of that 11 and 12 is the last couple of days. So a lot of producers have been have been harvesting canola. And uh, so uh, as comparison to previous years when a lot of producers would uh, would have had, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the crop uh, uh, done by now, uh, I think, uh, and kind of waiting on some of the lower areas of the straight cut canola to be ready to combine. This year, uh, because of the rain events, uh, a lot of the standing canola is drying down quicker and and, and helping producers get some acres off when normally, uh, if it was in a swath, it would still be uh, be too wet to uh, to take off. Been talking to the odd producer that said that they heard that there might be some canola in the swath starting to sprout. I haven't seen any myself or I've been talking to the elevators to to confirm that, but there has been some talk about some of the canola starting to uh, sprout. Standing wheat, uh, I guess besides uh, color, I guess uh, it's been uh, been holding on. Um, most producers I talk to are still in a position where they're looking at a, a two uh, in, in the elevators. Now, um, that was you know, probably before the last uh, rain. Uh, so, uh, you know, right now we're probably after the this this rain here, we could be looking at some threes. And I think the biggest issue there is, uh, uh, you know, the the wetting and drying and wetting and drying. What we're starting to see is more sprouts showing up on the wheat, and uh, and also the mildew situation, which is starting to become more of a factor in uh, in several of the uh, of the standing cereal crops. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, barley and oats are pretty much done, and I haven't seen uh, too many of those crops around yet, but uh, still uh, quite a few fields of, cere of wheat out there. I guess I took this picture um, a couple days ago now, and uh, this is one of the more unfortunate events of, of some of the swath crop. Uh, you can see the, the greening of the uh, of the top of the swath there and when you take a little bit closer look uh, at the heads uh, the uh, the wheat is definitely uh, sprouting and um, I think a lot of the cereal crops that uh, are sitting in a swath right now are uh, very vulnerable to this type of situation and I think when this starts happening we're starting to think of other options uh, we can do with some of this uh, some of this grain. Um, I know I've been getting some calls regarding 
uh, baling, regarding uh, round bale silage, uh, just uh, different ways of looking at, uh, at, at trying to get some of this crop harvested. And I think the biggest issue right now is a lot of that crop is, is, uh, is fairly wet, the swaths are fairly wet, and we just need some good drying weather to, uh, to get it to a point where we can start looking at what we might, might be able to do with it. Um, there is uh, potential for feed uh, there. So there are a lot of uh, beef producers that are looking for feed. So uh, it, uh, there, there could be some, uh, some things to be looking forward, look for in, in cleaning up some of these crops. Um, again, uh, moisture is the biggest factor in either keeping it in a round bale as green feed or trying to do some round bale silage, which might be your, uh, your easiest with, uh, with uh, the moisture levels a little bit higher. And again, just another picture of, uh, of more heads on, uh, in that same field. So uh, again, uh, you know, when you're looking at, uh, when you're looking at the cereal crops, uh, uh, swath crops right now are probably the ones that are most vulnerable or have been the most vulnerable. I still see some producers out there swathing. Uh, I think uh, guys are looking at different methods of trying to get the, the moisture level down. Um, a lot of tough grain has been taken off and a lot of the elevator systems are starting to get full of tough grain and producers are looking at other methods to see if they get the grain dried down quicker. Um, I think you really need to watch the forecast. Uh, if uh, they're calling for three or four days of dry weather, uh, then the opportunity to swath and maybe get it to dry a little faster might be there. Uh, I think the big caution there is you're putting grain down on ground that is fairly wet and uh, that uh, in a lot of cases, uh, that moisture will uh, rise into the swath uh, and uh, make that uh, those uh, those seeds uh, vulnerable to sprouting. So again, make sure the weather situations are going to be good before you start knocking it down and uh, you'll be better luck in saving a grade with it standing than with it uh, in, a, in a swath right now. I talked a bit about frost a few slides back and uh, I think uh, one of the crops uh, that's out there right now that uh, is probably the most vulnerable to frost is, is going to be the corn crop. And uh, a lot of the crop uh, is denting, but uh, as you can see by this uh, era corn that uh, the, it, it isn't denting yet and uh, it'll have an effect on the development of the rest of that seed. Uh, not saying that uh, this was a field that was going to be put up for silage. So, you know, there's still going to be um, some feed benefit or benefits from feed from this field. So it's not that a frost is going to eliminate the whole thing. I think it's the grain corn where we're going to have uh, more of our uh, problems with uh, if we do get any type of major frost uh, over the next two to three days. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the forecast right now uh, for the next, uh, uh, for the weekend in a ways is, is calling for some cooler conditions. I'm going to switch a bit from um, uh, the um, crops and talking about the, the crop situation out there to uh, looking more at uh, some of the questions that have been coming in. I've uh, been getting questions regarding, and this all goes back to drying grain and trying to figure out uh, what type of fans people need and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so I was getting questions on how to determine uh, how much grain is in a bin. Uh, so for this example here, uh, this is a, a round bin with a 36 foot diameter, 18 foot radius. And if you go to the top of the bin, so just where before the peak of the bin, you know, your grain depth is 18 feet. So for this example, uh, when you, the formula for figuring out how much grain is in the bin is you take uh, 0.628, which is a standard number, uh, times uh, your diameter uh, twice or, or squared times the height. So uh, you take the diameter of the bin in feet. So in, in this case, it's 36. You take the height of the bin in, with grain in it and uh, the grain in this bin is up 18 feet and your conversion constant is 0.628. So you take your 0.628 times 36, which is the diameter, times 36 again, times 18, and that'll let you know that there's 
about 14,650 bushels in the bin. So that would be at 18 foot height and 36 foot diameter. Now, all your bins aren't gonna be uh, flat on top. You're gonna have a, uh, a peak on the top. So the next question is, well, how do you figure out how much grain would be in the peak of that bin? Well, the peak of the bin for the top, uh, you take your bushels, uh, which is equal to 0.209, uh, times your diameter twice again times the height. So in this case, it'd be 0 0.209 times 36 times 36 times 6. And uh, that's your measurement for the level peak. So that would be this area right here, uh, the, the, six, the 6 feet. And that would tell you that the bushels are 1,625 bushels. Now you can use the same calculation for figuring out your comb below as well. So again, it's uh, uh, handy calculations, especially if you're aerating bin or kneading bin, a uh, bin that uh, is, uh, is uh, looking at doing some drying. I put this one up last week and I just thought I'd put this slide up again, basically just for the picture and just to remind people as to where they're looking for when they talk sprouting of grain and then where they're looking for when they're talking about mildew on grain and uh, with the mildew what we're finding is a lot of the uh, mildew is moving farther down the, the, the seed and as, as well as working into the crease of the seed. All those are definitely going to affect uh, you know your grading. So um, first major snowfall they're calling for might happen this weekend and I've heard that on quite a few different forecasts. Uh, this is the one out of the, the states that are, they're talking the movement of, uh, of the snowfall event. And then I seen a couple, uh, the last couple days on Sky Tracker, and uh, they showed two different models. Uh, the one model that uh, uh, where the potential for more snow uh, is, uh, it, when they showed this one, they said with the more snow we might, uh, the temperatures might not drop as, as cold and if they don't drop as cold maybe frost events won't be as as bad and then with the less snow uh, they're talking colder temperatures and uh, uh, more potential for more severe frost through through the area so uh, this was a map for Saskatchewan but uh, you can see where the systems are moving into Manitoba as well but that system seems to be moving at a northeastern uh, type uh, direction so Depending on where you are, the southwest part of the province is probably going to miss it, but we're probably still looking at, at cooler temperatures. We got a few questions this past week about grain drying, and one of the other questions was uh, uh, regarding um, uh, propane and uh, whether it's exempt from the carbon tax. So there are forms that uh, are available for producers to fill out. Uh, for the exemption and I thought I would just put these links up here because uh, it's uh, good information and uh, it uh, gives you uh, information regarding not just propane but also on uh, on any fuels that uh, are farm exempt so uh, I thought the, the links were good and I think uh, very ha helpful for uh, for producers. I also wanted to put this link up uh, Again, we're getting more and more questions regarding air drying and aeration and uh, Manitoba Ag has a, a good website regarding uh, air drying and uh, aeration and uh, so I put that link up there as well. And um, One minute here, I have a problem advancing my slide. Okay, so with uh, with that, uh, uh, just a few of the, uh, the seasonal crop reports, and I mentioned the, uh, these, and they're continuing to be updated. We're probably getting into the stage where the, the crop report is going to be uh, only up to uh, a couple more before it'll be ending for the season. Again, that's going to depend a bit on uh, on on how harvest continues here. Um, I had a request to put up the image of the sprouted cereals. Uh, um, so there, um, there it is right there. Again, just uh, showing uh, the sprouted cereals in, in the swath. Uh, 
um, if you're wanting, I could uh, probably uh, uh, get you this information later on as well. And uh, again, um, our Manitoba hay listing system, listings are still uh, being updated. So uh, if you're a producer that has some grain that might not be uh, as good a quality and you might be looking at doing something with it, uh, potential for marketing it uh, through the hay listings is probably fairly, fairly good. So take advantage of that and uh, try to benefit the best you can out of, uh, of working with some uh, poor quality forage. Uh, something that I've uh, missed doing the last while and uh, probably haven't seen a lot of burning yet, but as harvest continues on here, I just wanted to put this up that uh, the residue burning program is on. And I think uh, if you're going to be looking at uh, doing any burning, it's updated uh, daily at 11 o'clock. And there's the link to the, the website or the, the website where it will tell you whether, whether burning is permitted for the day or not and whether you need a permit if you want to burn. Again, the, uh, the group of uh, extension specialists in the province uh, that are uh, available for you to uh, uh, ask questions, get information from, and take advantage of the knowledge they have. So uh, if you have any questions, please contact uh, any of these uh, ex extension specialists. And I guess we'll be on again next week, October the 2nd. So. Uh, uh, if you want to join us, uh, that would be great.